Hello, Star Trek fans, and welcome to the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we're watching Star Trek Deep Space Nine from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today we are on Season 7, Episode 19, Strange Bedfellows. This episode aired April 21st, 1999. Before we talk about this one, anything to say about Till Death Do Us Part, last week's episode? No, it was perfect. It was an okay episode, but not up to the standards, I guess, that I'm expecting no. at this point in the show. We can do better. It was kind of fine. There were some parts of that episode that were like bad soap opera, <laughs> and I haven't complained about that in a long time. That's true. But well, we do get a last time on here with Magil Roddenberry, of course, and mostly we see Worf and Ezri's plight as Princess Leia turns them over to Weyoun. Yep. Still think they should have got Carrie Fisher in on that. They might have. You don't know. We don't see what's below those helmets. Time constraints. They cut the reveal. Sure. And then Magil says, and now the continuation. So still not the conclusion of this no. story. Ongoing. Yeah. All right. Well, I have the notes. So are you ready? I am ready. Over to you. There's some Kai Wen here, so you know I have a lot of notes. Oh, yeah. You were expecting that, though. Oh, completely. <laughs> and so is everybody. It's Kai Wen. <laughs> yeah, everybody's used to that by now. All right, in the cold open, Wei Yun tells the guards to put Ezri and Worf together in a cell so that they can physically comfort each other <laughs> on the long trip back to Cardassia. <laughs> yes, he says he likes to watch. Yeah, he <laughs> says he finds watching interspecies mating rituals fascinating. <laughs> which causes Worf to overreact, and then one of the Breen zaps him with his electric stick. After they drag the prisoners away, Weyun introduces Damar to Thought Gore from the Breen, and this guy doesn't much engage in conversation with Damar, and he kind of walks away as Damar just sort of squints after him. And we never see the universal translator working with the Breen. You just hear, like, the electronic sound effects. Yeah, where it just sounds like interference. Like, rah, 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 rah. Their modems are connecting. But later on, Damar does seem to understand them, so the translator must be working, but just not for us. Out in the hallway now, we see the founder woman make a real effort to get her form back into shape before stepping into the room to meet the Breen dude. Oh, yeah. She's totally putting on the whole image that everything's fine, even everything's if great. outside the door, I'm all crinkly. Yep. We learn that the secret subspace communications she was having previously were with the Breen. She says she's sure they'll sign the treaty documents within the next few days, and Damar complains that he hasn't even seen any treaty documents, though Weyoun just shushes him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the founder says an alliance between the Breen Confederacy and the Dominion will end this destructive war. With the Breen by our side, the Federation won't be able to stand against us. They'll be erased from the face of the galaxy. Together, we can bring peace to the galaxy. <laughs> Hi, yikes. I was very much getting that vibe. Yeah, I can see that. I think this is where we cue the theme song, but I didn't write it down for some reason. I'm pretty sure that's where it happens. It's a good enough point. We'll just say it's there. Yeah. Nobody will notice. Well, now Damar is reading the mystery treaty on his little device. It would take <laughs> yeah. a long time to read something on that device with like two lines on the screen. He's got very good eyesight. It's yeah. Very high density. No, oh, maybe. Well, Damar isn't happy. He calls the treaty outrageous because there are territorial concessions that the Cardassians must make to the Breen, but they aren't <laughs> spelled out in the treaty. Weyun continues to placate him, saying it's all itemized in a secret document between the Dominion and the Breen, and all that is required of Damar is for him to just sign the document. Damar <laughs> wants to see the details, but Weyun just dismisses him and tells him to chat with Thought Gore. But Damar is livid, and Weyun finally says that he seems to be implying that Cardassian territory belongs to Cardassia and not the Dominion. Yeah. And then Damar backs down. There's your problem right there, Damar. Everything you have belongs to the Dominion. Uh, yes. And I did like when Weyun says he can't see the treaty because, well, it's secret. <laughs> yeah, it's a secret. I do think this is a very important point for Damar. He's starting to figure out here that... Now you're just the junior partner in this alliance. Yeah. And maybe not even junior partner. You're not even a partner, no. You're now becoming just another slave race for the founders. Yes, you're just supposed to sign this document and do what we say. Yeah. Yep. Well, then Damar says that the Klingons are attacking Septimus III, and he says the Cardassian troops need reinforcements. Weyun says not to worry, the situation will be dealt with. He says, we won't allow your brave soldiers to perish in vain. He says, you have my word. So we're also seeing that operationally, Damar has absolutely no power. 
he can't send his own reinforcements. He can't use Dominion reinforcements. He's now basically completely at the mercy of Wayun. Now, is this because of the drinking or is the drinking because of that? I'm going to choose the latter. He's drinking because his power has slowly been eroded to this point. If he can't even organize reinforcements for his own forces. Yeah, and now he sees them bringing in the Breen. Yes, who are now the most favored child. Exactly, yes. And by the way, Wayun in the scene, he says he won't allow the soldiers to perish in vain. He doesn't actually say he's going to do anything about it, <laughs> but DeMar kind of misses that. Yeah, you can interpret that many ways. Mm -hmm. Now we go to the station where Martog seems pleased that Septimus III will fall within the week. Martok has heard about Sisko's marriage, and he says he doesn't want to talk about the war with the Dominion, but the war at home. He calls marriage a long, <laughs> grueling, intoxicating war, and he tells Sisko about the day Sorella first moved into his home. He had a pet targ that Sorella loathed, and while she was supervising the unloading of her bags, she accidentally, in double quotes, <laughs> left the front door open and the targ tottered outside and disappeared into the forest forever, never to be seen again. Martog did point out that that targ was smelly and mangy, <laughs> and it yes. sounded like it was basically on its last legs. Well, quite old, because he said he'd had it since he was a boy. Yeah. I don't think that was an animal that was in peak condition. No, no. And then keeping with the theme of war, Sisko says, Lady Sorella draws the first blood. Martag says he wouldn't trade Sorella for all the targs on Kronos, and he's won his fair share of battles, but he knows in the end <laughs> she will win the war. I will point out here, you really don't want to take relationship or marital advice from the Klingons. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. think, you know, Martog and Cirilla may be deeply in love in the way Klingons are, but I don't think that would translate very well to other races. No, I mean, I could see when you're watching this that you could look at this as almost a weird, old-fashioned view of marriage. But realistically, for Klingons, everything is a battle. Yes. Otherwise, there's no glory. Right. Yeah. So that, it does make sense for sure. And and yeah, if you're going to take advice from the Klingons, you would, in this case, in this, I guess, particular situation or topic, you would have to understand that that's <laughs> the case. I think Klingons, even if they agreed, would fight on principle. Oh, yes. Because that's <laughs> the fun. Well, yes, exactly. Yeah. I do find the idea of an indoor targ to be quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to do some overanalysis here. Oh. I think Cirilla was actually doing the honorable thing here. <laughs> Letting the targ out? Yes, because it was old, mm -hmm. it was way past its prime, and she was allowing it to go into the forest and die honorably. Oh, I see. Sure. In its environment, maybe even in battle with younger targs, kind of like Kor. And that's probably what she told him, too. Yes. And maybe because Martok was so invested in this animal that he'd had for so many years, he wasn't prepared to make that step. So Cirilla was actually doing something honorable. A fair interpretation. Now we go to Ducat and Kai Wynn in bed, <laughs> feeding each other fruit. Having breakfast. And it's not the usual honeydew melon. Did you notice that? <laughs> it actually looks like they've got some kiwi, some papaya, and a mango. Well, she is the Kai. You're definitely getting the premier fruit plate. Apparently. They laugh about Ranjan Selbor, Kai Wynn's little helper dude, disapproving of their relationship. She should be listening to him. <laughs> Kai Wynn says she's happier than she's ever been in her life because the prophets are smiling on them. Not only did they bring them together, but they've also given them the great task of restoring Bajor. Dukat says, our world will be reborn with you as its leader. It's sad to see Wynn so happy. It's sad. <laughs> it's <laughs> ominous for sure. Kai Wynn says she prays she'll have the strength to do what the prophets are asking of her. Dukat says he'll be at her side, and he also kind of works an angle here by pointing out that the prophet said Sisko had faltered yes. and was standing in the way of their will. Oh. This makes Wynne say the love of the prophets is strong, but so is their wrath. I love the way Dukat is just playing into all of her prejudices. Yep. He's saying all the bits that she obviously thinks, he's saying them out loud. <laughs> yes. Tragically, he knows exactly how to play her. You kind of feel bad for Wynne because she does actually seem happy. Yeah, and, well, two really big things are happening here. Someone is 
reinforcing what she already thinks and believes, which, yes. you know, we all tend to yeah. lean in the direction of someone who agrees with us, right? <laughs> it just, it's a natural thing. Yeah. But on top of that, she's being really manipulated because she thinks the prophets are finally talking to her after all this time. So yeah. she actually thinks she's being rewarded for her behavior right in this moment. But of course, that's all going to change in this episode. But I can see why you say you almost feel bad for her because you can see all these things that are happening to her in the same moment. Yeah. Do we want to bring up that Wynne was actually the leader of Bajor at one point and kind of screwed it up so badly she almost (laughs) ended up in a civil war? Well, I'm sure that was just Frank. Wasn't that Frank Langella? It was Frank Langella's fault. Oh, no, that was after Frank Langella. Remember where Kira almost ended up in the insurgency with uh, good hair again? Right. Yeah, I forgot about that. With Shakar and his amazing hair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's already proved she's not qualified for the role. <laughs> she doesn't think so. Now, before we leave the scene, more over analysis. Do you think the Parwraiths somehow briefed Ducat on what Wynn really thinks of what her true feelings are? Because he seems to be really like on the nose here. So is Ducat this flexible that he can play along, that he sees the things that are working and adjust his plan accordingly? Or has he been given inside information, as it were? Well, I don't know, because you don't really have conversations with the prophets or the yeah. paw wraiths. I guess I was thinking two things. One, he has spent some time hiding out on Bajor, right? We covered that a while ago, and so yeah. he probably did get some inside information. And even when he was running that little cult, he may have gotten lots of info from oh, that little yeah. Vedic guy, right? Right, on her thoughts and feelings, yeah. I think that's one thing. And then the other thing, he may have heard some of it from Kira oh. when he was on the station with her. Yeah. Although I don't know that she would tell him stuff like that. Yeah. But she may have told the daughter. Yeah. But he's pretty sneaky. He's probably listening on conversations. Oh, well, yeah. That's probably true. Why? What do you think? I'm thinking he got briefed. By the Parathes or yeah. someone else? By the Parathes. Okay. I mean, he's smart. But he seems to really know what things work with her. Well, if they told him, and this is something I have in my notes, that she's the chosen one and they say it later in one of the visions, I guess they could have said that she has been ignored by the prophets and but she's capable of being the spiritual leader. You know what I mean? Like they may have just told him enough in a vision for him to go, oh, she's just like me. She's almost as ambitious as I am. Yeah, she just needs a little ego stroking because I guess if you step back and you think about it that way, he's treating her as if she's him. Oh. So to him, it's maybe obvious that this would work because he just needs some ego stroking because he just, you know, he thinks he's a genius. So it could go either way. He sees somebody as ambitious as he is and knows Mm -hmm. the kind of things that work with him. And if he believes what the paw rates are telling him... Which he clearly does. Then, to him, what he's saying is truthful. He's saying these are the true leaders of Bajor. We should listen to them. And those other prophets, they're false gods. So, of course, they didn't talk to you. So, if he truly believes it, I don't think it's that much of a stretch for the way that he's talking to her. Okay. Now we go to Ezra and Worf, who are hanging upside down in their cell. And Worf says they have to find a way back to the station to warn Starfleet about the Breen. Ezri agrees, but says they have a few obstacles in the way. And plus, she's starting to feel space sick again. So nothing going too great for these two yet. What was the point of this silly scene? I think it was just to show them hanging upside down. Oh, okay. Because it was kind of funny. Back to the station, and Cisco is cooking dinner when Cassidy returns from a trip, and they call each other Mr. and Mrs. Cisco because (laughs) nothing has changed in 300 years, and of course she would take his name. Yeah. Anyway. I do like how she says everyone's treating her differently now that she is the wife of the emissary, or the Bajorans are, rather. Yeah, she says she's noticing people that she's worked with for a long time are treating her differently now that she's the wife instead of the girlfriend of the emissary. Yeah. And Cisco also says there's been a request for her to perform an annual blessing of women on the station who want to get pregnant. And Cassidy is like, uh, no way. I'm not going to suddenly start acting like I believe in the prophets. That's yeah. your problem. When Cassidy heads off to take a shower, Cisco says, and so the battle begins. <laughs> And as silly as that is, he actually delivers that line quite brilliantly. I thought it was very cute. Okay, I'm going to talk about this now rather than over analysis. I think this shows the importance of how you should discuss things before you get married. Yeah, I guess he could have warned her, but also maybe she should have known that was going to happen. Right. 
Because you're not on the, you're no longer on the outside. Now you're on the inside. Yeah. Maybe even look into the history of Bajoran religious leaders. Yeah, maybe do a little research. Yeah. Yeah, that might have been smart. What is expected of the partner of a leader? What do they have to do? You could make the exception of you don't have to necessarily be a believer if this is a Bajoran cultural thing. That's true. I'm taking part in a Bajoran cultural festival. It doesn't mean that, you know, I'm a believer in the prophets. They are. Well, and even if she just looked at how Cisco has evolved over time to just sort of accept all of it. Yes. She could have seen that coming for herself as well. Plus, it's not a question of belief. We know the wormhole aliens exist. So if you're taking more of a, if you're like atheist approach of, I don't recognize there are gods, I recognize that these aliens are powerful and can make an impact on the planet. The Bajorans want them to help in their lives. So if I take part in a ceremony where the Bajorans are asking these super powerful aliens for help, it's almost like it's a practical thing rather than a religious ceremony. That's how I would justify it to myself if I was in that position. Yeah, but... It'd be like asking Q for something. Oh, I see. But if you're an introvert, you just don't want to be a part of it. Oh, that's one that's thing. That's entirely different. Yeah. But it's also like... I can't remember what episode it was in, but remember back when Jadzia said she'd quite like to be worshipped or whatever it was? <laughs> like, yes. she'd really enjoy that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she would. I think that made sense for Jadzia, but if... Cassidy doesn't want to get onto that religious slippery slope where people are looking at her differently. I can respect that. I think it's too late for that. But she doesn't, she hasn't accepted that yet. Oh, okay. I guess this is part of almost like Cisco's journey. Well, yeah, that's what I mean. I don't want to be part of this. It's too late. You're part of it. Right. That's what I mean. If she would look back on how Cisco has evolved and his feelings towards the whole thing, she might find it inevitable that she's just going to have to accept that she's going to be part of these ceremonies. I can see, though, where she might just be trying to tell herself, no, no, I'll just stand on the outside and it'll be okay. Yeah. Because that's what Cisco kept trying to do. And that might work for a while, but it's not going to work forever. Oh, gosh. You know what this could result in? What's up? The prophets bringing Jennifer back from the dead. Oh. Like with a quorum and saying, she's the real wife of the emissary to teach Cassidy a lesson. You know that? <laughs> yeah, they can be a little nasty. Boy, you'd think he might have thought about asking them for that. Hmm. That's a whole can of worms. I don't think I'm ready yeah, to open that can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> now back to Ezri and Worf, and Worf is trying to take the cot in the room apart to make himself a weapon. And they bicker a bit, and Worf said he was seduced and betrayed by Ezri, which is quite rude. <laughs> and the rest of their conversation is pretty ridiculous. So <laughs> we'll just move on to when Wayun comes in with Damar and two armed Cardassians behind him. Oh, I thought Wayun hit maximum smugness in last week's episode. No. (laughs) No, no. he's very smug. He managed to dial it up two more. Yeah, he says he was going through some of the info that came from their mental probes, and he was hoping to get some more clarity on things. Damar steps forward saying it's his duty to inform them that they'll be turned over to a Cardassian tribunal where they'll be tried as war criminals. Ezri asks what the charges are, but Damar says, that's not for you to know. All you need to know is that you'll be found guilty and executed. Oh, you gotta love Cardassian justice. Yeah. It is very efficient. It's consistent. Yeah. Wayun says, your sentence will be reduced to life in prison if you cooperate. When Ezri makes a snide comment, Wayun steps in with the results of her memory probe and says... You know, my dear, it would be such a shame for you to die without the good Dr. Bashir knowing how you feel about him. As he smirks, Worf just grabs his head and snaps his <laughs> neck, and Wayun falls to the floor dead. <laughs> Damar stops the Cardassian guards from shooting Worf and looks at the dead Wayun on the floor and just starts laughing. I love how much Damar laughs here. He really is enjoying this. Yeah, and it's a good thing it's Cardassian guards with him and not Jem'Hadar, because that would have ended differently. Very good point. Damar says, overconfidence, it's the hallmark of the Wayun. <laughs> he says, maybe the founder should eliminate that from your genetic recipe next time. So, strike number seven. And then he tells Worf, they'll just make another copy of him, you know. He says, you should have killed me. There's only one Damar. And Worf says he'll keep that in mind. <laughs> Back on the station, and Dukat and Kaiwin are drinking their blue wine again and giggling to each other. She says she wants to know more about Angel. That's the fake name of Ducat in this scene. She wants to know about his family and his childhood, but just then she goes into another vision. Wow, they managed to step right in before Ducat had to say anything. Yeah. 
The Cisco prophet says, We are of Bajor. And the Kira prophet says, We await the restoration. And Kaiwin says she's met the guide they sent and she's ready. She says she gives herself to the prophets. But they start calling her the chosen one, saying, She must embrace us. And then the truth comes out as one of them finally says they want to be restored to their rightful place in the celestial temple. Yeah. Reject the false prophets and walk our path, embracing your destiny. And then the Cisco alien says, feel our love, the love from the Pau race. And then his eyes turn red. Yep. And she snaps immediately out of her vision and is understandably quite freaked out. (laughs) She tells Ducat to find the priest and tell him to bring the orb. She says she must bear her soul to the prophets and beg for their forgiveness. And Ducat leaves looking quite smug. Oh, yes. He is Wayun level of smug. Yeah, he's like, ha ha. He is very pleased with himself. I do think it's interesting that given this vision Mm -hmm. and they're saying all the kind of things that would appeal to Kai Win, like you're the chosen one, that her reaction after coming back is horror, that she's really rattled and wants to bear her soul to the prophets and beg for forgiveness. I thought it was fascinating that there was a line that she didn't seem to want to cross, even though she's having this vision and being offered this by the Parites. Well, I think it's just a shock still, Yeah. right? She just needs some time to absorb it a little bit. Go over the contract, yeah. <laughs> Back to Cardassia, and Damar is having yet another drink when Weyun 8 enters. He's having a good laugh at that as well. Damar laughs and offers a toast up to Weyun 7, who is now dead. <laughs> yes. And Weyun 8 asks when the prisoner execution is scheduled, and Damar says tomorrow. Weyun asks if the prisoners have agreed to cooperate, and Damar says no, and then he laughs and says, maybe you should talk to Worf again. <laughs> Very funny. He does seem to be enjoying this moment. Then in comes the Breen, thought Gore, and he screeches something. Still can't get his modem to connect. No. Damar is instantly annoyed as the Breen seem to have full access to all of the Cardassian databases and systems. But Damar's concerns are ignored again, and Weyun says, Damar now has to make all of his military recommendations through Thought Gore, not right to the Founder Woman. Reinforcing he's now very much the second fiddle. Yes. He shouts that he will not do that, but Weyun threatens him, of course, saying he will do as the Founder says, or he can schedule an execution for himself as well. And Damar backs down again. Naturally. Back to the cell, and Worf has finally taken apart the bed and made himself a weapon while Esri messes with the control panel and gets the door open. Out in the hallway, they knock out the Cardassian guard and make a break for it. Worf pretty quickly gets shot in the leg and tells Esri to just leave him, and she says, Oh, shut up. (laughs) That reminded me of Jedzia. Oh, that is so classic Klingon. Yeah. And this is a much better version of them, I think, too, just this little interaction. Yeah. But it doesn't matter because they don't get far before they're recaptured. Back on the station, Quark is filling Esri's glass on the bar, a thing he does every day in hopes that she'll return. Miles calls it morbid, but Quark says he's going to keep doing it until she comes through that door. When Miles complains again, Quark tells him, no one's forcing you to sit there, which is a good point. They're all sort of moping about missing Worf and Esri, and Julian says she was an old soul who was young at heart, and then he leaves the bar and leaves Miles looking quite confused. I thought Miles was being kind of odd here. I think Miles would have been totally on board with the pouring out a drink for a friend who's not there. I agree. That they don't know that she's dead. It's not really morbid. It's just they don't know where they are. This is like putting a candle in the window kind of thing. They needed an opportunity for Julian to deliver that stupid line. And I mean, Esri and Julian have barely interacted this season. Yeah. It feels really forced, like they're working really hard to convince us that Esri and Julian belong together, and it's just so dumb. It's pointless. <laughs> Back in Kaiwen's quarters, and she is pacing, waiting for the orb, Ducat asks what she's planning when she gets the orb, but she says it's far beyond his ability to comprehend, <laughs> which is quite a burn. We see Wynne's true personality coming back yes. out here again. She is being very, I'm the Kai, don't question me. And Ducat's as well as he's just like, oh my god, this woman. In comes the Orb of Prophecy, better known as the Migraine Trigger. Kaiwen kicks everyone but Ducat out, and she opens the Orb. As the Migraine Trigger spins, Kaiwen waits for her message from the Prophets, but nothing happens. She says something is wrong. The Prophets won't speak to her. She closes it, saying, the Prophets have forsaken me because I've been in communion with the Evil One. Okay, do you think Kaiwen ever communicates with the Prophets? Well... 
Uh, yeah, that was my question at this point, too. Are we supposed to think that they've spoken to her this way before? Because she, yeah. over and over, she says they haven't talked to her. Right. I mean, I remember asking that question a long time ago. So does that mean that the orbs have no impact on her? That's exactly what I think. Then why did she even call for the orb? I think... If it's never worked. Maybe she's still thinking that that first vision was really the prophet's. Oh. That this second vision was the Parathes. Okay. Uh, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Or maybe she's just desperate thinking that this is the time that they're going to talk to her. She's clutching at straws. And she spent her life believing that she was doing the right thing and following yeah. the prophets, even though her faith, I think, has always been questionable. She's at the very least expecting at some point yes. that she's going to get rewarded for what she's doing. Very much so. What does your family call it? Like studying for the finals or what was it? <laughs> what, what was it? Yes. Cramming for the finals. Cramming for the finals. The phenomena of <laughs> aging relatives suddenly becoming ultra religious. Yeah. Ducat grabs Kai Wen and finally he comes clean. He admits the Pa Wraith sent him. He calls them the true gods of Bajor. And Kaiwen is freaking out. <laughs> yes. But he says they're not evil. They care about Bajor and they want to make it strong. She calls him a heretic and she slaps him. But it's kind of unconvincing the way she slaps him. Yeah. Almost like a fake slap. Well, I think he's getting through. He's selling the par race to her. And from Ducat's perspective, they're probably not evil. No, right. He says the prophets have done nothing for you. They've turned their backs on our people during the occupation which is just rich coming from that jackass. <laughs> he says, you've sacrificed everything for them, and how have they rewarded you? They appointed an alien emissary, and even now they won't speak to you. She calls for her priest, but Dukat covers her mouth and says, the Pa race will give you everything you've ever dreamt of, the love of the people and the power. He says, despite your protestations of humility, that's what you really want. <laughs> Again, this is like him looking in a mirror. Yep. Yep. Stop pretending to be something you're not and take what they're offering. She kicks him out and he leaves without a fight, saying, crawl back to your prophets and beg their forgiveness. Wow. Live the rest of your life in Cisco's shadow. Oh, that was powerful. It was. I wonder, though, does she know that Cisco's mother was a prophet? That's a good question. Because she might feel quite differently about calling yeah. him an alien. I don't know. But I can't imagine Cisco really told a bunch of people about that. Kira knows. Yeah. But did he just tell Kira recently because of that vision? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great point. Would Cisco keep something like that quiet? I mean, it's kind of important for the Bajoran people, for the Bajoran religious yeah. faith. And he's embraced his role, so... Yeah. But at the same time, it might also kind of make it worse for him. It might make people start worshipping him. Ooh. Rather than just asking for his blessing. That's a really good point. You would want to avoid that. You would want to avoid that, yeah. You brought up before how you're pretty sure there's a church of a quorum on there and there's a church of Cisco. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, for sure. This whole scene, it's so interesting. We talked about it a little while ago, but it's just like Ducat and Wynn, they're quite similar, ego-driven, you know, just waiting yeah. for someone to tell them that they're the chosen one. And I don't know, it's just well done. I think you're right about Ducat of seeing himself in her, mm -hmm. driven by ambition. Yeah. I mean, that's Ducat to a T. But if you look at how he was behaving in the cult episode, that's what yeah. I mean, where he's thinking that she's just like him, that she wants to be worshipped by these people and loved I think that's part of the rivalry with Cisco. People like Cisco. She sees that anybody who likes Cisco, that's somebody not liking her. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, after the dramatic ad break, Kai Wen continues pleading to the orb, but nothing happens. Finally, she gives up and she calls Colonel Kira, surprisingly. That was somewhat surprising, yes. Well, yeah, rather than like returning home or going to a temple or something. No, she calls Kira. But when Kira gets there, Kai Wen is back in her fancy robes to make her position clear. I mean, her position is Kai clear. <laughs> yeah. She tells Kira that she knows, Kira believes, she puts her political interests ahead of the spiritual well-being of the Bajoran people. Well, duh. And surprisingly, Kai Wen says she can't disagree with that assessment. And she starts to cry, saying she has strayed from the path the prophets have laid out for her. And Kira is instantly sympathetic, saying she prayed the prophets would open Wynne's heart and change her. Yes, this is incredible. Yes. Of 
all the people for her to break down in front of. Yes. And admit the truth, Kira. Well, which is why it's kind of surprising she didn't go back to the planet rather than, yeah, yeah, just calling on Kira, the one person who doesn't believe that she's the true (laughs) spiritual leader. Maybe that's part of the whole point of Kira is the only one not fooled by her. Yeah. You'll get an honest answer from Kira. Yeah, and maybe momentarily she really did believe that she was doing what the prophets wanted. Do you know what I mean? Asking Kira would be the will of the prophets. Yeah. Well, Kai Wen says she'd do anything to earn the prophets' forgiveness, and Kira says it's not too late. Even the worst of us can be redeemed. She says set aside the things that led you astray, like ambition and jealousy. Turn away from that and give yourself over to the prophets. And Kai Wen says she'll do whatever it takes to make herself worthy. And then Kira says everything will change once she steps down as Kai. Well, bad news. (laughs) She'll do whatever it takes, but she won't do that. (laughs) I'll do whatever it takes, except this. But not that. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Kira says, but it's the power that led you down the wrong path. Oh, no, no, Wynne says. I'll be better able to serve the prophets if I remain (laughs) as Kai. She says, if the prophets wanted me to step down, surely they would have told me, which of course we all know the prophets have told her nothing at all. So that's just a flat out lie. Straight into misdirection, straight into rationalizing. It's perfect for win. All the defenses came right back up. Yeah. All the same stuff was coming right out of her mouth. Yep. I will do anything except anything that will affect me. (laughs) Yes. That's literally what she's saying. It was so perfect. Kira says, sometimes the prophets speak to us by touching our hearts, not with words. And then she says, good night and leaves. (laughs) I I love this scene. Oh, it was great. It It shows the absolute moral bankruptcy of Wynne. It's all about power for her. It's all about influence. It's all about her position. Well, it's all about her. Period. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I've mentioned this before. Wynne's view of the world is if she wants something, it's obviously what the prophets what want. What the prophets want. Her yep. wanting it must mean that the prophets made her want that. Therefore, what I want is that thing. God says I can keep all the money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this is the yeah. perfect example. And it's so well played by Louise Fletcher. The way at the beginning, she literally is contrite. She is asking Kira for help. She really is almost like bearing her soul. And then soon as Kira says the one thing that will fix this situation, that will actually show Wynne's humility, how she can save herself. The fences come straight back up and she turns right back into that political animal that Kai Win is and how just driven and morally bankrupt. Yeah. Well, a sociopath, yeah. Yeah, the sociopath. Yep. She should have said, I've killed people to get to this position. That would have been funny, actually. <laughs> it's anytime someone like that asks somebody else for advice or asks them a question, all they want that person to do is reinforce what they were already thinking. Yeah. They don't really want advice. No, no. <laughs> they want agreement. Yes. Oh, you're saying you're sorry, you feel bad. I'm sure the prophets forgive you. Oh, yeah. The prophets <laughs> of course, are fine Kira's like, no, no, actions speak louder than words. Right. Back to Cardassia, and Thought Gore and Wayun are sharing a joke. At least Wayun is laughing. Thought Gore is just continuing to make weird noises. <laughs> Damar is upset because the entire Cardassian order on Septimus III has been wiped out. 500,000 men are gone. And Wayun says, Oh, yes, a great tragedy. Now we get to the heart of things. <laughs> Wayun never promised to send reinforcements. He simply promised the situation would be dealt with. The Klingons dealt with it. <laughs> right. He says the slaughter wasn't in vain. It forced the Klingons to commit valuable troops and resources to capture a strategically worthless planet. He says they died in service to the Dominion. There can be no greater sacrifice. And Damar wonders how many more sacrifices his people will be asked to make. Um, how many people are left? That's how many sacrifices. <laughs> yeah, how many Cardassians are left? Yeah. Wayun says we are all one in the Dominion and we will all make whatever sacrifices the founders ask of us. This is the whole problem with getting involved with these people who are just worshipping their leaders. It's not just that they're following them. They worship them as gods. They can't make a mistake. They're perfect. The hierarchy goes, the gods, everybody else, who are disposable. Right. Well, Damar stomps out. Wayun figures he's just off to drink some more, which is a pretty safe bet with Damar. And that is how it starts, where Damar goes off to his quarters and starts drinking. 
But then he sees himself in a mirror and he throws his next drink at his own reflection. Oh, finally, something's happening. And they're like, are we finally doing something? Yeah. He's reached the breaking point. Although, strictly speaking, those 500,000 Cardassians who died, mm -hmm. it is the never ending sacrifice. So, that's true. It is a good Cardassian thing. Back to Worf and Esri in their cell, Esri says the Dax symbiont has lived over 300 years and experienced eight lifetimes, and now it's all going to end. Worf says there's no honor in self-pity, and Esri tells him to stop acting self-righteous, which I'm like, has she met Worf? I mean, that's his normal behavior. <laughs> I just don't like any of the interactions between Worf and Esri in this no. whole episode. My note is it's just lame between the two of them. Yeah, not till kind of the end. The, the very last, uh, well, the thing that's coming after this, I yeah. think, is is okay. But but I agree with you. Yeah, it's childish. It's the ultimate in need to do better. Is this the best writing you had? Really? Yeah. yeah, it's such a cliche. I mean, it's almost like a young adult novel. Like they're teenagers. A bad one. Yeah, not a good one. <laughs> that's a good point. Ezra says she wouldn't even be here if she hadn't tried to save Worf's life. And then they bicker some more with Worf saying she didn't do it for an honorable reason. I mean, so what? She still did it. Uh, yeah. So if I save your life for a non-honorable reason, would you rather die? I mean, the Klingon, maybe. Or Worf, at least. Uh, yeah. She asks if he's angry with her for something she did or because she's not Jadzia. And then she asks if he loves her, but he doesn't really answer. Ezra says maybe he's feeling guilty because he doesn't feel the same way about her that he felt about Jadzia. She says maybe sleeping together was a mistake and we should just forgive ourselves. <laughs> but Worf isn't quite ready to back off, of course. Later, after an ad break and some time to think, Worf says Ezri is right. He doesn't love her as he loved Jadzia, and he's dishonored himself by seeing Jadzia instead of Ezri. Ezri understands as she too wasn't seeing things clearly. He says his motives weren't spiritual, and Esri says, we're just people who make mistakes. She says she never knew she had feelings for Julian, and Worf says he finally believes her. They agreed to be friends, at least for the short time they'll be alive. At least the ending of that scene was okay. Exactly, yeah. I thought the very end of it was like, oh my god, finally. Yeah. We could have gotten here in a very different way, but uh, yeah. we did finally get there. I think my notes on all the Esri and Worf scenes in this one are, blah, 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 please be over. <laughs> Blah, 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 Ginger. Blah, 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 Esri. <laughs> well, in comes Damar and two Jem'Hadar guards. When the Jem'Hadar start escorting Esri and Worf down the hall towards their execution, Damar shoots the guards from the back. He tells Worf and Esri there's a Cardassian patrol ship waiting for them. Its computers have all the necessary info to get them past any security checkpoints. He says to tell the Federation they have an ally on Cardassia. When Worf asks if they can trust him, he says, well, you can either trust me or you can stay here and be executed. And then he hands them the Jem'Hadar weapons and Ezri and Worf head out. I like how Ezri says, I like the first option more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She's still got that sense of humor. She does. Well, now Wayun and Thought Gore are annoyed Ezri and Worf have escaped. Damar says Wayun is the one who put the Jem'Hadar in charge of the detention area. And then the founder woman calls Wayun for a chat, and Damar gleefully says, I'm sure she'll understand, and if she doesn't, I look forward to meeting Wayun 9. <laughs> Finally, Damar is having a good time. He's enjoying this. Yes. Well, time for the big finish. We go back to Kaiwin's quarters, and she's called to cut back for a chat. Solbo doesn't seem to be enjoying his job, does he? He's not having a good time. She says she remembers when she first saw the gate of the Celestial Temple, also known as the Wormhole open. She was on the promenade when it opened and all the people around her claimed they could feel the love of the prophets washing over them. She says she felt nothing. <laughs> Uh-oh. She says she smiled and pretended she did because it's what was expected. <laughs> She's always been a phony. Mm-hmm. But she probably just thought they were all faking it, so she just Ooh, faked it too. Wow. She says the prophets have never spoken to her or offered her guidance, and yet after that, she's supposed to step down as Kai to be forgiven by them. She says, no. And Dukat <laughs> says, merciful gods don't ask their children to make such sacrifices. Yeah. Which is a weird line because that's exactly what they do. She says the prophets turn their back on her and she's run out of patience. She will no longer serve gods who give her nothing in return. Oh, there we go. That is so in. Yeah. What's my cut of this whole thing? She says she's ready to walk the paths the Pa race have laid out for her. And Dukat says he'll walk with her and no one will be able to stand against them. She says those who dare to try, the Federation and its Vedic puppets, the false gods and their precious emissary, Ugh. will be swept aside like dead leaves in an angry wind. 
The end. <laughs> Yikes. Oh, Oy, that was scary. And the other thing here is the whole tone of it, that they owe her. They owe her something. And then tells the story and says they've never given her guidance. Further proof, she's never experienced the orbs. Well, she's lost her faith. The thing that Kira doesn't use the word in this episode, but she's used it many times, which is that you can't expect to hear from your gods. You have to have the faith to believe it, no matter what happens. And Kai Wen has been trying to convince herself for a long time that she had it. But now she's, whether she had it or not, doesn't matter. She doesn't have it anymore. It's gone. (laughs) I don't think she ever really did. I think she's just too ambitious to admit she didn't. I mean, we've kind of moved into overanalysis already here, but I think there's an argument to be made that someone like that yeah. thinks that's what everybody is like. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, I you know, you. she's not behaving any differently from anyone else. Everybody else who wanted to be Kai was equally ambitious. They also weren't really seeing anything. They were making it up or whatever. They're all frauds. Yeah, I think it's just you have to tell yourself that they're all like me. They're all frauds. Yeah. Exactly. Otherwise, you think you are a fraud. So, so this way... Nobody's a fraud because we're all just like that. (laughs) It's all about ambition and power. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. That's a good take on Wynn. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of over analysis points, but I assume you've got some. I certainly do. First one. Let's talk about the marriage thing. Don't listen to Klingons for marriage advice, but I feel that there's a subtext here, which is this bizarre view of marriage. It's almost like a throwback to, you know, like the silent generation or the greatest generation with this sort of, I never wanted to get married, but society forced me to. And I really (laughs) hate this partner that was really forced on me by society as a they'll do. I was like, wow, this is a really, really cynical view. And even with Cassidy and Cisco, where he says, oh, the battle begins. You're not in a war with your partner. What are you even doing with them? If that's your view. I didn't look at it quite that negatively, which is shocking, because normally I'm the one who would have that view of it. Yeah. I actually thought, at least with the Cisco part of it, he was sort of playing that for laughs when he says, and so the battle begins. Yeah. Because maybe Cisco is smart enough to realize that what Martog said really was from a Klingon perspective. Yeah. And you had to take that with a grain of salt because to them, everything is a battle because <laughs> there's no honor if it's not a battle. Right, right. And so he found that sort of funny. And then when he realized he was going to be constantly negotiating, because that's true, right? You constantly negotiate and compromise and yes. and whatever when you're married or in any kind of a relationship. In order for it to work, you have to do that. Right. It's not a battle, though. It's not a battle. No, that's what I mean. It's a negotiation or it's yeah. you just are working to make each other happy. That's completely different from it being a battle. But I took it as sort of a joke when he said, and yeah. so the battle begins. <laughs> and also he had that funny look on his face, you know, as he was putting hot sauce in the pot. I don't really think he thought it was a battle. Yeah. Yeah. Because he even said when Cassidy said something like she wasn't going to all of a sudden start pretending like she was religious. He actually said to her, I don't want you to do anything you're uncomfortable with. Because maybe in that situation and maybe over time she will agree to it. Yeah. But right at that moment, she's like, I'm not doing that. Interesting. Do you know what I mean? He yes, didn't yeah. like turn it into a battle. He didn't make it negative. He didn't yeah. say you have to do it. It didn't go super negative. So I guess I took that in a little bit more lighthearted way. More of a joke. Based More on of a joke. What yeah. What Martog was saying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I didn't quite take it that way, but I agree. There's something mixed in there about yeah. whoever wrote this or directed it that marriage to them isn't what it is to you and me. <laughs> right. It's just, it's not the same. And it's kind of sad. It feels like a generational throwback. Yeah. Especially when 300 years in the future, she's just going to take his name. I mean, why wouldn't they <laughs> share a name? There why is wouldn't that, yeah. they come up with a new name? Or why wouldn't they combine Cisco and Yates? I mean, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's very, very stuck in the past. Take the last name Emissary. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> Eminence. Change your last name to Eminence to annoy Kai Wynn. <laughs> so surprising, I'm the one with the more cynical view. I think it was just that delivery of Cisco of those two lines. Yeah. The one where he said, Sorella drew first blood and then later, <laughs> so the battle begins. I don't know. It was funny to me. Yeah. Next thing. Yeah. So I wonder how long Wei Yun has been making the tactical or the Vorter have been making tactical decisions, the military decisions and cutting the Cardassians out. 
Oh, I think for a while. Yeah. I think as soon as the founder believed that she was going to forge a new relationship with the Breen, I think she started cutting out the Cardassians. Yeah. Because she said something a while ago. I can't remember how many episodes ago it was, but she said the Cardassians have been a disappointment. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. I think since then. Do you think Damar has even been aware of this? Has Wayun been Mm -mm. shielding him, pretending, oh, the strategic decision forced me to do this. You weren't available. You were drunk at the time. I think the the way maybe we're supposed to look at it is Damar's drinking has caused him to neglect this whole area. Yeah. Every time something goes wrong, he goes and has a drink instead of paying attention to it. It's a way that he's blinding himself. It's the way he puts the blinders on. So up until that point, it was almost like he wasn't aware of what was going on. And suddenly it's like, hey, wait a minute. We're the second class citizens. Yeah. We're the second tier in this yeah. alliance. Third fourth tier. (laughs) Yes. At this point, you're cannon fodder. (laughs) Well, yeah, that's exactly what happened to them. It was just a way of drawing away Klingon resources. Yep. Next thing, my take on the Breen. These guys are the ultimate opportunists. There's a couple of ways of looking at it. I'm thinking the Breen, they somehow know that the founders are dying and are making no progress with the cure. No, they might. And they're rolling the dice that after the founders die off, The Cardassians are done. The Cardassians are no longer a force. The Breen can subjugate them easily, leaving all the former Dominion and Federation space in their control. Yeah. They're taking a big gamble, especially if you can look at what they've done to the Cardassians and say to yourself, yeah, we're going to get an alliance with these people. We're going to throw in our lot with them. Unless, of course, uh, what's his name? Thot Gore is actually a changeling themselves. But because they like the cold, so Mm. if it's very cold, they could hide the fact they're starting to fall apart. But I see it more as the Breen are ultimate opportunists. They're rolling the dice on this because they have the inside track and they think that they're going to end up top of the pile when the founders die off. Hmm. Well, I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, it's possible. We don't get a lot about the Breen you know, I mean, we can't even understand what they say. So <laughs> it's hard to interpret their <laughs> motives. <laughs> exactly. It's it's very hard to just make up a backstory yeah. for them with very little info. But I, I think it's possible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. All we've seen with the Breen at this point is they turn up with thermal detonators and uh, Wookiees. <laughs> yes. And I think because we talked a lot about Win already, that wraps up my over analysis. I think my main point in over analysis is just a yeah. question. How did Dukat know that the orb wouldn't work for Wynn? I don't think he did. Unless the Parwraiths had briefed him that she is a fraud. She can't talk to the prophets. She's never had a vision. I guess it's, yeah, maybe he just believed that they were the false gods. So nothing was going to happen with that orb. The orb was meaningless. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe he just had a suspicion. Uh, Maybe. I think your point is the really important one of he sees himself in win. Yeah. And that ambition. Maybe he was making a gamble there as well that it wouldn't work. Even if she did get something from the orb, it wouldn't be what she wanted to hear because she's so ambitious. Oh, I see. Remember way back in the episode where we first met Costumogen, the yes. one where Kira and Jake were overtaken by a prophet and a paw wraith and they had that battle on the promenade. Yeah. In that episode, I remember saying maybe Kai Wynn is part of a prophecy that involves the paw wraiths, that maybe she's written into that story. Oh, yes. I couldn't give you any spoilers. <laughs> well, oh, well, good point. But I guess that's possibly what's going on here because they're trying to tell her anyway, this is her destiny. She's the chosen one for this. So she is part of some prophecy, yeah. just happens to be written by the Pa race instead of the prophets. And so as part of that prophecy, maybe the the story is that this person, the chosen one of the Pa race, is never talked to by the prophets. Like she is constantly cut off from them. Oh, so if you'd looked it up in the book of Pa race, it would have been the chosen one was abandoned by the maybe. prophets. Yeah, and they could have told that, I guess. I mean, there's that whole thing, right, where Dukat, he says that he's reading some ancient texts, yes. right? Whatever it is that led him yeah. to the Pa Wraiths. Because that's where he found the Costumogen thing. So maybe in there yeah. was this prophecy of this person. Oh, so he could have got all his information from those prophecies he and gone, have. that sure sounds a lot like Win. That's what I'm saying. Wow, that would be really deep. And yeah, my second point 
we've already talked about, which is that Ducat is such a perfect person to understand how to manipulate Kaiwen because they're so much alike. <laughs> they each look at themselves in the mirror in the morning and say, I am so important. I am the most important. <laughs> I am the most important. <sighs> You'd think Wynn would understand from that perspective that Ducat isn't good at sharing. So why would he be helping her? Actually, she doesn't know it's Ducat. She doesn't she? know it's Ducat. Yeah, and I guess yeah. they never seemed to have met when he was Ducat. Right. She thinks he's just a simple farmer. A simple farmer. Yeah. Sent by the Powraiths. Well, let's go to women in the future. And I think we finally got to a better point with Worf and Esri, as they both realize they're just not meant to be together. Yeah. The final two lines, I think. Yeah. Still just really silly that they've been captured. They're about to be executed. And this is what their story is about. This is the conversation that they're having, right? Yeah. It just could have been done better. She's still worried about boys. Yeah, exactly. The story is just, it's disappointingly dumb and just so unnecessary. We don't need it. But that's all I have this time in Women in the Future. So let's go to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down or neutral. What is your rating? I am giving this a thumbs up. Everything with Worf and Esri was dumb apart from the last two lines. <laughs> but Kai Wynn and Ducat were spectacular. Mm. And Kira. And the little interaction between Martog and Cisco and Cisco and Cassidy. Oh, yeah. Those little things were all good. Mm -hmm. And the whole fall from grace of Wynn is spectacular, just beautifully portrayed. Louise Fletcher, once again, just gets who she's dealing with. <laughs> beautifully done. Thumbs up. You know, early in this episode, when Kai Wynn was sitting on the floor begging the prophets to talk to her and it wasn't happening, yeah. I was thinking in that moment that this wasn't really Louise Fletcher's best performance, and I wasn't really buying it. Yeah. But then, later, I realized that that was because of all of the fear and the false modesty of the character. I mean, I might be reading way more into it than what really happened. No, I don't, don't think you are. <laughs> like, like, even she didn't really believe that it was going to happen, because they'd never talked to her before, and they weren't going to talk to her then. It's almost like she was finally realizing oh, this thing that I am, it, here it is. It's all now come to fruition here in this moment. And then once she got up from the floor and she took off her cute little white robe and she put her Kai robes back on, she was right back in her own zone of self-importance. I'm so important. Yeah. And then that scene with Kira and Kai Wynn, it was so good. And then you had that final scene with the line about the angry wind, and it was just chilling. Yes. It was delivered so well. So I had to see the whole thing before I could yeah. appreciate it. So by the end, I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> now I get it. I even appreciate that we finally got to the end of, I hope, the end of the Esri Wharf nonsense. I, I wish we had done it sooner, and I wish we had done it a different way, but we finally got there. Thank God. But we've clearly done all of that just so Julian can end up with a girlfriend. It's so stupid. I mean, I'm just going to, okay, I'm just going to put that on a shelf. That wasn't the main part of this episode. I'm just going to set it aside. And I'm going to say, overall, this is a thumbs up. I enjoyed everything else except that. And I think that has been a weakness of this show since episode one. Yeah. So I have to accept that as the weakness of the show that we are not going to end. It's not going to go away before the end of the series. A valid criticism. Sometimes you have to take the bad with the good, I guess, although I, <laughs> that's not normally what I want to do. I think that wraps it up. Yes, that wraps up Season 7, Episode 19. Come back for Episode 20 as we're hitting the home stretch here. Oh, yeah. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over-analysis of this or any episode, or if you just want to say something nice, you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com. We're also on all of the social media platforms at Rebingeit, and that includes YouTube. And you can join the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Deep Space Nine podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. 